Yep, hear you loud and clear. Awesome. All right, guys. Sorry about that. Just some technical difficulties there, as uh, as always. Um, so uh, I'm focusing on neuroophthalmology in the eMERGE and just some pertinent uh, things that we can take away from that. I want to thank everyone for kind of zooming in um, and thank Dr. Uh, Chantal Forrestal uh, for our help here as well. Uh, let's just get started. So no disclosures of any kind. Uh, so why did I pick this topic? Uh, you can thank this guy right here. So he's an esteemed neuroop uh, working out of Houston and during some, you know, uh, late night R5 studying, you know, just videos for some clarification and that just escalated into a fascination spiral of death, um, you know, with the ultimate re realization that rodents could do a bit better. Um, I do think, you know, we will see patients like this in the ED. So going over some key pearls and highlighting an ED based approach, may be a big help. So that's what I hope to accomplish. Um, so in terms of objectives, uh, we're just going over kind of a case, some fundamentals, an approach to ptosis, diplopia, pathologies. If we get into positive, negative visual symptoms, that's great. If not, no worries. Um, so um, neurologic presentations, you know, there's often a very extensive differential, um, and the the workup's not often feasible in the ED. Um, but you know, with some understanding of these pathways, of applying the exam, we can delineate. You know, Um, and it will be a little bit heavy, so I apologize for that, but I, I am happy to send this out afterwards kind of as a reference or as uh, something you can go over again if you like. Um, so in terms of a case, uh, just quickly going over, I'm not going to pick on anybody, uh, but so you have a 53-year-old gentleman presenting with two-week history, I, red eye, um, right upper lip swelling, wasn't resolving with antibiotics, given by the walk-in clinic, denies any visual acuity changes, diplopia, pain, wasn't any travel, re review of symptoms was otherwise on exam, um, you know, you have what you see there. Um, there is some chemosis. The, the eye's a little bit down, a little bit out, um, and there's a partial limitation of optimal gaze. Um, and the endoscopy was not helpful. Um, so I just want you to think about, you know, you've got this. It's a, it's a complicated problem potentially. You know, are you thinking about cellulitis? Is this down and out and somebody with ptosis that you think might be a CN3 palsy? Is this something weird like, you know, Romana sign of Chagas disease. So think about the urgency of imaging, what you can actually accomplish in the eMERGE and what service would this person need to go to? Is this person going to medicine, neuro, or just going to ophthalmology for clinic? Uh, so we'll touch on the visual pathway. So just noting left goes to right and right goes to left. Um, lesions care, have kind of characteristic features um, at a particular level of the optic tract. And you can localize them based on that. These are those distinctive patterns uh, that we've seen before. Um, so some basic rules of thumb, uh, pre-chiasmal towards the orbit, do not respect uh, midline um, and may have an RIP help clue you in there. Um, lesions that respect the midline, that therefore, are outside of the orbit. Um, chiasmal lesions classically uh, result in that bitemporal deficit. However, you can get asymmet like asymmetric compression um, that also involves the more anterior uh, optic nerve. So don't, don't hedge your bets just on that. And then post-chiasmal lesions uh, should be the binocular loss of various size kind of uh, wedges, the pie in the sky on the same side and always respects midline. Um, otherwise, if it's a cipital uh, cortex, the macula is spared. So that's generally how you can think your way through that. In terms of the pupil pathway, just homing in on that, um, the light response, so, so in, the afferent pathway is via the optic nerve CN2, and the efferent pathway is CN3. Uh, pupil response is symmetric and consensual, given the uh, two points where uh, tracks split. So there's the uh, decubation highlighted in yellow at both those spots, <clears throat> where right and left afferent input divides. So at the, at the chiasm, and again, at the Edinger West Wall nuclei. So pupil size overall in a healthy person relates to the net amount of light both eyes are exposed to. Um, and this is useful to us in that assessing pupil response as well as RAPD can help narrow the differential diagnosis. Mike, can you stay a little closer to your microphone? Because uh, you're kind of coming, you're drifting in and out. I'm not sure if others are having the same problem. Sure, no problem. Let me know, let me know if it's a little bit easier now. Um, 
In terms of RAPD, so the tests performed just by swinging back and forth between the eyes and observing the pupil that has the light exposure. Um, if RAPD is present, it's helpful. As you know, there's some kind of asymmetric defect in the afferent arm or the pupil pattern. Um, Mike, Mike, we're still losing you, and Julie has suggested maybe are your are your speakers on high by any chance? I'm not sure how that helps, but they are. Yeah, yeah. it's if it, if his speakers are picking up on an echo, then it will cut his voice out. Okay, let me let me turn those guys. How's that? Well, you you have to speak for a bit because it comes and goes. Oh, okay. All right, let's try this and see. Um, so. Let's Oh, and so most often the lesion is going to be somewhere along the optic nerve. Um, so the RAPD helps you there. Uh, in terms of just performing the, um, the RAPD. All right, I'm not, I'm not going to attempt fade and get out of this screen and all that. But um, you swing the flashlight uh, between each eye, and you're looking at the eye that you're shining the light. It continue to dilate as you shine the light, or is there a significant uh, asymmetry in the blood of that response when, when it does constrict? So that's the classic RAPD. Um, in terms of uh, some commandments, kind of of an RAPD, so uh, you can induce an RAPD. So if you linger on the pupil and unequally distribute the light to one pupil, you're temporarily kind of bleaching those retinal cells, just as like when you would look towards. And so you'll eventually produce an RAPD um, in that pupil that's getting more. So just try to be equal between the pupils. Um, and then the, the other commandment there, so uh, cataracts should not cause an RAPD um, because lesions anterior to the pupil pathway should not cause that. And that seems surprising, but it's explained due to the fact that, you know, the retina of healthy should compensate over minutes for any diminished brightness. Um, just as if, you, as if it does when you walk into a dark environment. Uh, so RAPD is caused by lesions anywhere starting from the retina. However, retinal disease has to be, you know, it has to be quite severe for an RAPD to be clinically evident. So something, you know, where the macula is off or, um, you know, at least two quadrants. So nearly half, half of that retina is off. Um, lesions distal or posterior to the geniculate body. Um, you don't have to remember kind of the geniculate body or whatnot. Um, but it's just, there's a point in the optic tract in the visual pathway where the nerves branch towards the brainstem and then the remainder of that visual uh, information goes to the cortex. Once that splits, you're no longer going to have an RAPD as that's split off. So lesions posterior to that that can affect vision, cause visual field cuts, won't cause an RAPD um, because the nerves have already branched off towards the uh, brainstem uh, at Inger Westfall nucleus. I'll discuss point number four there a little bit later. Um, and the other interesting thing is you can't determine the side of lesion based on the RAPD location. It's quite common to actually have a contralateral RAPD when uh, the lesion is on a particular side. Um, and that's because there's more fibers from the optic tract coming from the contralateral eye, uh, given the temporal visual field is larger than the nasal visual field. Um, so that's a bit counterintuitive and don't be shocked by that. Um, so you have a patient presenting with, you know, visual acuity loss and RAPD, you know, they have a unilateral afferent pupil pathway lesion. Um, if you have visual acuity loss, but no RAPD, you got to consider is the lesion pre-retinal or posterior to the geniculate body, as we said, so like a stroke or a mass, or is the lesion bilateral and symmetric, or lastly, is this a midbrain lesion? So we'll get into that. Um, reverse RAPD is just something I want to comment on this. It's not really truly reverse, you're doing the same thing, you're just focusing on uh, the different pupils. So this, this is just a trick if somebody that comes in with already long-standing kind of unilateral efferent uh, pupil pathway disease. So, so someone who you know, has been damaged previously or whatnot. So in, instead of focusing on the fixed pupil that's not, not constricting the light, you're swinging the flashlight and keeping an eye on the pupil that is reactive. So that can let you know um, that an RIPD exists. Um, and why is that important? Um, really, like you need some kind of approach um, for someone who has a known past history of a fixed pupil with, with efferent disease um, and comes in with new symptoms now. So that'll give you a little bit more information to help work through potential uh, imaging modalities that you need to do. 
Um, and then even if the unilateral uh, pupil is acutely fixed, checking for the RAPD can help take you from, you know, a CN3 uh, palsy pathway where you're aggressively thinking about some kind of aneurysm to, you know, maybe CN2 and CN3, which means the lesion is in the orbital apex and you need to do different imaging. So it, it does provide you with useful information. Um, I want to mention there's a special type of RAPD called a tactile RAPD, which is just basically think there's a midbrain lesion that uh, can lead to an RAPD, but it's an unusual in the fact that there's an afferent pathway lesion, but there's no complaints of visual loss, visual acuity is normal, and there's no papillary edema. So I think where that's important is uh, your patients that are presenting you know, a different headache or you know undifferentiated nausea vomiting all the typical things that you might that might clue you in to do you know a dedicated eye exam might not be there so just always check for an RIPD in these people because you might be surprised and this is particularly I think important in the pediatric population where I find often we're focusing on you know is there papilledema is there not papilledema um, that does or does not have to be present uh, in the contents of significantly elevated uh, intracranial pressure um, and you may not have any other clues uh, that that's going on. So don't be reassured by that um, and always check for the RAPD. Um, in terms of uh, the next test that I think really gets your differential diagnosis further is near light testing. And you really should test this anytime where pupil response is absent or sluggish. And it's definitely required if you find an RAPD or there's a note of anisocoria on your exam. Um, near testing still works in patients with complete blindness. So just note that, that you, you can uh, check for this in patients. And that again, gives you a little bit more information to work with. In terms of the utility of near light testing, if patient has decreased visual acuity without an RAPD, uh, light near testing helps unmask that, you know, there's by chance symmetric bilateral afferent uh, pathway defects. So something like, you know, optic neuritis where both nerves are somewhere involved or a midbrain issue from hydrocephalus and shunt malfunction. So it is very important to test this. Um, and um, if an RAPD is present, uh, light near dissociation basically confirms if the efferent pathway is, is also effective, uh, which is often enough to get you to an actual diagnosis. And I'll explain that a little bit on the next page. Um, so this is just kind of the uh, anatomy behind uh, testing for near light. So there's basically two inputs um, with, uh, within the CN3 nucleus that results in pupillary uh, constriction. And one of them is light coming through your light pathway, as we just discussed. And the other one is coming from higher up in the brain that feeds into the Eddinger Paschal nucleus, which sits within the CN3 nucleus. Um, so to trigger uh, the Eddinger Westfall uh, area from the higher centers of the brain, you just trigger that via near response, and that's independent of the light pathway. Um, so you can actually test the afferent and efferent uh, arm of, the, of your pupil constriction with this testing, basically. Um, so why do you care? Um, and I think where it becomes important is that you have someone with anisocoria and you know, syphilis is the perfect example. So you've got someone with a you know, RL Lyme pupil, and this is really the only way that you'll pick that up. Um, so syphilis causes an isolated lesion and differentiating between an isolated lesion there versus an efferent lesion like a tonic pupil or something like that can be done by just taking advantage of isolating that nucleus with the near response. So if it's intact um, and there's no other associated neural findings, you know, congrats, you, you, you diagnose neurosyphilis. Um, if not, you know, the patient can get outpatient non-urgent follow-up for something that might be a tonic pupil or whatnot. Um, and remember that th this can reveal bilateral afferent disease that isn't asymmetrical enough to cause that RAPD. So you got to think midbrain lesions, hydrocephalus, that kind of thing. Uh, we'll just skip that. Okay. Um, in terms of the biggest things you need to consider with near light dissociation, it's not a long list and it's really four main considerations. Um, really only one of which is going to be uh, needing emergent workup. Um, so the, the considerations would be a tonic pupil, um, so, so, which means basically some kind of damage to the ciliary ganglion or distal. And Addy's tonic pupil is a specific um, etiology there where it's idiopathic uh, issue with that ganglion. Um, optic nerve or severe retinal disease, it's generally pretty obvious um, why the pupil's not responding light. So you'll have you know, significantly affected visual acuity. Um, so that 
you won't really need light near testing for that um, as visual acuity is generally spared in the other, other causes. So this should be pretty obvious on the remainder of your exam, but it is, is a cause of near light dissociation. Um, dorsal midbrain syndrome, I think, is the biggest thing that you want to catch and that you got to consider in people coming in with headache or, you know, VP shunts in place. And you might get the classic paranoid syndrome where, you know, you get the um, sun, like vertical gaze, palsies, um, and um, you got to suspect that in all your kind of neurosurge patients. Aberrant nerve regeneration is an unusual thing that you may see. It's really of no consequence for us, but just being aware of it can help you make sense of what you're seeing. And that uh, relates to some kind of damage to the CN3 nerve that heals incorrectly. So now the re to the ciliary ganglia has happened in an incorrect balance. So now you're getting uh, pupil convergence uh, with some kind of um, CN3 stimulus to another area. So if it was you know, medial rectus that was innervated by those nerves and now it's resulting in pupillary constriction, whenever you try to look you know, medially, you might get that. So that's just something to be aware of. And then the last thing just to comment on is, you know, we've been talking about near light dissociation, but is the, is the, is the opposite true where, um, you know, your near response is affected, but the light response is intact. And that's just never a thing. So you don't have to worry about that. That just means the patient's not um, focusing on the exam. Um, I do want to touch on Argyle Robinson pupil versus Addy's pupil because, you know, the difference between them is something to note. Um, and it's been something that's been confusing me in the past, but really it's pretty straightforward to tell apart when it's presenting acutely. So an acute tonic pupil pretty much doesn't respond to anything. So it's not responding well to light and it's not responding well to near. Um, so you're getting a unilateral, generally big pupil, doesn't constrict well to light or near. And if it's an isolated finding, you know, you, you discharge them with outpatient clinic follow-up. Um, it's a little bit more nuanced if it's a chronic tonic pupil, and that's kind of where the name tonic comes from, because eventually that, re that near response heals, and you'll get a very prolonged, hence kind of tonic response. And in contrast, the, the Argyle Robinson pupil, it's classically a midbrain lesion, basically pathognomonic for syphilis. It's often bilateral, so right there you've got a big clue. It's a small pupil rather than a dilated pupil, and you have excellent uh, response to near so that you don't have uh, night, sorry, near light dissociation. And that patient just gets admit for neurosyphilis workup with neurology. So our job really is considering light near testing once pupil response is abnormal or there is an RAPD that you found. Once you identify that there is light near dissociation, you really got to consider, you know, is this a bad retinal detachment, which will have other big clues? Or is this a dorsal midbrain lesion? You know, do they have a shunt? Is there concerns about increased ICP? And lastly, you know, is this syphilis? And then if you don't really have an etiology, just I think at that point, it's appropriate to have a discussion with neurology or ophthalmology to clarify, you know, disposition and kind of what kind of tests they need and when, just because you haven't homed in on a diagnosis. Um, in terms of extraocular movements, there's the primary actions that we always see. Um, and there's really just kind of six directions of gaze that truly isolate a certain muscle. Looking straight up, looking straight down doesn't actually isolate a specific muscle. And that's something we've been taught before, but I just wanted to point it out. And just, I think importantly, the superior oblique is the primary uh, in order of the eye. And that becomes more important in specific cranial nerve palsies, which we'll get into. Um, in terms of uh, checking the extra ocular movements, there's kind of what you see there in terms of a dedicated, you know, complete exam. In the ED, we're generally doing what's called versions, which is basically checking the, the motions with both eyes open. Ductions is when you're doing it with one eye closed. Um, I think the biggest thing just from here is just, al just always check if, if patient can fixate on a spot, um, as it can quickly clue you into some kind of ocular coordination issue and the, and the fact that you need to test, like do a full neurologic exam on them. Saccade uh, asymmetry, if you do see that, you gotta think brainstem or cere cerebellar disease. Um, in terms of ptosis, um, it's, 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 it's more straightforward than we generally think. In terms of what's normal, so the normal lid covers about one to two millimeters of the upper cornea, and the lower lid should basically meet uh, the cornea at the bottom there. There is some person-to-person -person variability in what normal lower lid position is, but the upper lid is generally pretty, pretty constant. Um, in terms of the normal anatomy, if you look there on the right, um, both the levator and the Mueller muscle have some role in lid elevation, so you've got to consider both. Um, levator is a CN3-based uh, effect and is much more pronounced than Mueller's, which is a sympathetic-based effect. Um, and in the ED, we generally want to just consider a few things and, and rule those out, and other causes can be seen non-urgently in clinic, and those things would be a CN3 palsy 
foreigners minus Cena Gravis. And all this can be done at the bedside. So in terms of Anderson's, you know, I care, but I'm not concerned scale. You've got one on the left and one on the right there. So when you're actually concerned, you've got findings of potentially a complete or incomplete CN3 palsy. So have a look at extraocular movements. Are any involved? Um, and have a look at that pupil. Is it big? You generally should have associated findings there. Um, in terms of um, a Horner syndrome, always something to consider and um, direct your exam accordingly there. In terms of neuro neuromuscular disease with myosinia gravis, again, you should have something on history to clue you in there um, further. In terms of the, you know, I care, but I'm not concerned. Is it pseudotosis? You know, is the opposite lid retracted for some reason? Is it just excess skin that's completely benign? You see a picture there. Or is this kind of chronic degeneration, which is called aponeurotic or myogenic? Um, so in terms of the care list, the CN3 palsy has more of a pronounced ptosis um, than often the subtle, uh, more subtle kind of one to two millimeter ptosis in foreigners. And again, that just has to do with levator uh, versus Mueller muscle, which is sympathetic. Um, you can also look at the pupil to help you out there. Um, and that's in the totic eye. So a CN3 pupil is dilated, whereas a Horner syndrome uh, pupil is myotic. Furthermore, CN3 should always have some kind of extraocular movement issues while Horner's generally wouldn't. Um, in terms of myasthenia, you've got the characteristic fatigability. The pupil's always normal. So if the pupil's ever involved, don't think myasthenia gravis. Um, and then you can check for um, different tests like the ice pack test, Tensilon test, and Colgan lid twitch. Um, so you've got some quick bedside things you can do there to delineate that. In terms of the, you know, you care less, those are the, the factors that we already talked about. It actually is pretty common after cataract surgery, so you can always ask about that. About 6% of people will have a post-operative ptosis from that. Um, you know, the, Opto talks about measuring levator function and whatnot. That's not really relevant for us. Um, the only thing to note is levator sparing is more reassuring um, in terms of, you know, myogenic cause and whatnot. And in terms of treatment, persistent ptosis beyond six months, they'll, they'll look at maybe getting some surgery. So this isn't a super um, urgent issue. And most CN3-related ptosis will improve significantly on its own. All right, uh, switching gears just to diplopia. So this is a, a, a big part of the talk. Um, it's rare, but potentially dangerous issue. Uh, makes, about, makes up about 0.1% uh, of all ED visits. Um, and I think it's important to comment on some terms um, that come up. So what binocular actually refers to. So that's when someone is experiencing diplopia while both eyes are open. And then it resolves when one eye is closed, which is contrasted to unilateral monocular diplopia, um, which is really what most texts are referring to when they comment on monocular diplopia. What's not mentioned in most kind of approach to their text is that bilateral monocular diplopia, um, which is basically where you cover either eye results in ongoing diplopia. So you, you, ha you haven't been able to identify an eye. And uh, I think if you get something weird like that, you do have to consult stroke team as that might be something called uh, cerebral diplopia. Um, so that's really the one caveat where you have an actual neurologic cause of monocular diplopia, which otherwise you don't generally care about too much. Uh, Concommitment just means that the diplopia does not vary in any direction of gaze, whereas non-concommitment uh, non -concommitment. Uh, worsens in a particular direction. Um, in terms of etiologies, you know, Rosen's always throws out huge lists. You get this big list, it's super intimidating, and there's, you know, some buzzwords associated with uh, each symptom and what you should consider. But honestly, it's not super helpful in deciding what do you do, how do you assess for this, and how are you going to get some kind of disposition. So I'm just going to focus on some approaches from the literature to help give you some practical way to sort through this mess. Um, every approach begins with uh, a history to determine if this is a monocular or binocular diplopia, as we talked about. Um, and, you know, from here on in, monocular is referring to the unilateral monocular diplopia, not that, you know, rare other instance where you're getting monocular diplopia with either eye closed. Um, to determine if it's binocular or monocular, really just always make sure that one pitfall here is that it goes away with either eye being closed just because off, on the off chance, you know, they close their right eye and that's the one with the actual monocular disease, you might erroneously go down the binocular pathway. Um, and if you do get a monocular issue, it's not a neuro op issue, you know, at worst, it's something like a retinal wrinkle. Um, you basically can reassure yourself with pinhole testing, which should generally improve that. And those just get referred to an ophthalmologist for non-urgent assessment 
Um, binocular issue though is an ocular uh, misalignment issue and is a neuro-op issue. There's many causes and we'll kind of get into how you can work through that. Um, so how neuro neurology approaches the copia, they often use a top-down approach and focuses on localization, which I want to highlight a little bit for understanding, but an easier approach is kind of coming on a little bit later. Um, and just overall coordinating ocular motility to ensure that your brain sees like a single fused image is, is pretty complex and it relies on input from various, you know, cranial nerve nuclei as well as higher order cortical areas. Um, so uh, lesions affecting those kind of higher cortical connections um, are termed supranuclear. Uh, lesions between those connections are internuclear and those affecting, you know, the nerves and the cranial nerves themselves and the neur neuromuscular junction are called infranuclear. And you can see some of the big causes there on the right. Um, hence, using these terms, you can kind of try to try to fit them into a pattern based on these three kind of areas. In terms of the supranuclear and intranuclear, you can think of them as one. Essentially, these are all getting admit um, as stroke might be uh, a cause here. Uh, and the clue is really that you expect some kind of other neurologic signs and symptoms that, that are in keeping with stroke. And they're often much more prominent than the diplopia itself. Um, I, I will just touch on two caveats to that, which is skew and INO. Um, which can cause isolated diplopia and are a super, sorry, and are a super nuclear or intranuclear cause that also should be admit. Um, so skew is is often with other cranial neuropathies or kind of some hemisensory loss or paresis, but it can be isolated and it it, it generally is not benign. Um, it looks similar to a cranial nerve four palsy as you get some vertical uh, ocular misalignment, uh, but it relates to vestibular ocular connections. Um, and it's essentially a posterior fossil lesion until proven otherwise. Um, INO is the classic, you know, most localizable lesion um, and results from dysfunction at the MLF. Um, and so we'll talk about that. Um, and again, like I said, it's a straightforward disposition if you have diplopia with any other neurologic signs or symptoms, uh, as that's, you know, uh, admission for stroke workup. Uh, I know here, let's see, it might work. So this is just uh, video highlighting uh, bilateral INO uh, with some of the classic findings. So just have a look. That's an additional finding where you get that vertical diagnosis that can help. And remember, it's a it's a problem with you know, medial gaze, so the eye, the eye is not able to look nasally on that side, and then you get nystagmus in the contralateral eye because of that uh, ocular misalignment. And basically, it's, it's classic for MS if you see this. Um, so it's a loss of crosstalk between cranial nerve 6 and the cranial nerve 3. Um, so you've got an issue with conjugate eye movement. On, on, on the left there in that picture, um, you see the right eye is the pathologic side. Um, with the left developing nystagmus when the pathologic eye doesn't follow. Convergence is classically preserved, so they'll be able to cross their eyes generally. Um, and then they may have that vertical gaze evoked nystagmus, which we talked about. Um, just an FYI, there are some fancy syndrome names for INO that occur with additional lesions. So like you might hear one and a half syndrome, eight and a half syndrome, all these things. It's essentially just adding further palsies to what you've already identified as an INO. Um, so, you know, adding a, a cranial nerve six palsy or something like that. Um, but really, if you've, if you've already delineated there's an INO, you know that person's getting admit for workup and getting an MR head. In terms of infranuclear causes, the issues either going to relate to cranial nerve palsy or really myasthenia gravis, which can mimic a lot of things. Um, the history in these, in these particular situations um, can note which muscles are involved and can clue you into myasthenia uh, gravis versus uh, CN3 palsy. Um, once you're actually testing those extraocular movements, classically, there's four rules to identify a weak extraocular muscle, which we'll chat about. However, I think um, you got to consider it may, diplopia may relate to muscle weakness or muscle restriction on the opposite side. So keep both possibilities in mind. Um, and I think if your exam is not isolating a specific cranial nerve, again, you got to consider myasthenia. And if you've kind of gone through the history in the exam and it's not suggestive of myasthenia, uh, consider does it involve nerves of the cavernous sinus or the or the orbit? Um, you know, is visual acuity off, which in, which suggests CN2, and that suggests you know an orbital process um, rather than a uh, isolated cranial nerve kind of issue. 
Um, these are the four kind of rules of ocular muscles. It, you know, they make sense when you think about it, but it's not easy to recall, you know, when you're working in a busy eMERGE. So I'm going to just give you some simplified uh, points on the next slide here. Um, so if the double vision is worse on looking side to side, think and obsess for cranial nerve six. If there's some CN3 findings, you know, down and out, ptosis, dilated pupil, anything like that, at least think partial third nerve palsy. Um, if, to, you know, uh, vision improves with a bit of a head tilt, the double vision is primarily described in the vertical gaze, um, and it's the worst kind of looking to one side and down, you, you think uh, CN4. Um, with CN6, you can also find that the eyes appear somewhat crossed, um, and that's, that's often the lateral rectus issue. If you're stuck, unfortunately, now you got to reference that prior slide and look up those four rules to help you out. Um, last place there. Um, in terms of localization for diplopia is kind of orbital apex disorders. And it, those are three groups of things, which is like a cavernous sinus issue, superior orbital fissure or orbital apex lesions. You don't really have to differentiate between the three of these because, uh, you know, historically they're taught separately, but they're similar causes. The evaluations essentially the same and management strategies uh, really depend on the causative etiology that you're going to find on dedicated imaging. Um, and so you really get to this point if you've accessed your patient for diplopia. They don't have super nuclear neural deficits, so you're not going down the code stroke uh, pathway. There's no INO, there's no skew. You don't have features suggestive of myasthenia gravis, and you can't isolate a particular cranial nerve. Now you're probably dealing with an apex disorder. Um, other clues, you might have some ocular pain, some chemosis, some proptosis with these. Um, and then the one tidbit is if cranial nerve two is involved, now you know you're at the orbital apex distal to the cavernous sinus as uh, cranial nerve two does not pass through the cavernous sinus or prior there. Um, and another hint you might have there is visual acuity complaints or an RAPD. So think about this in anyone with ophthalmoplegia, decreased vision or numbness in like a V1, V2 distribution. Um, and I think anyone that you consider, consider to have this, always consider a molar infection uh, or like, like a dental infection that's tracked up to the buccal space into the orbit. Um, now, if, if, if that all kind of hurts your brain, this is an excellent paper that goes over an ED disposition-based approach, much simpler, focuses more on disposition rather than localization, and it does kind of mirror that neurology approach, but without emphasis on localization, which we, we generally don't have time for in the ED. So notable key considerations in this kind of pathway that it, it is pretty straightforward. Is it binocular or is it not? If it's monocular, again, we don't care as much, outpatient follow-up. Binocular. Are there associated neural symptoms? Think stroke protocol. Um, if not, you know, are they over the age of 50 or 60? Always consider GCA, consider, you know, CRP, ESR, and consider that diagnosis. Um, otherwise, can you isolate to one cranial nerve? If no, really the person's getting admit for an MRI. Um, so, you know, some people comment on it's safe for, you know, a semi-urgent outpatient MRI. But I think given how rarely this comes in, it's not unreasonable to admit these patients with an MRI if you haven't isolated to a specific nerve. If you do isolate to a specific nerve, though, um, really all but CN3 policies can be discharged without, uh, with non-urgent follow-up. Um, some authors comment on getting a CTA in cranial nerve 6 just to make sure there's not a carotid aneurysm. But that's very, very rare. And again, most authors say that that, that can be a semi-urgent uh, imaging modality if things progress. Um, and I'll just chat about CN3 in a little bit more depth. But basically, isolated CN3 is treated as a true emergency. And I just want to mention Wernicke's encephalopathy, um, as it didn't specifically come up in the algorithm. Um, it's super subtle. It can cause you know, death and significant morbidity if not treated. The classic triad is really in only one-third of patients. And the fact that encephalopathy can be something as mild as memory impairment really isn't helpful. And the gait findings are completely subtle. So I think it should be considered in anyone presenting with, uh, you know, pupillary, INO, extraocular movement complaints, just because it's a difficult uh, thing to confirm clinically. Um, and so just treat on spec with thiamine. mean, you expect improvement within hours to days of the ocular findings. Um, and confusion generally subsides over weeks. So it's never wrong to treat for uh, potential Wernicke's. Um, so now moving on to a cranial nerve uh, three palsy. Um, so the cranial nerve three, as you see on the right there, leaves the brainstem and then enters the subarachnoid space. It passes through the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus and finally divides the branches 
as you get into the orbit. Um, and you got to consider lesions anywhere along here. Um, and just note that, you know, partial C and 3 lesions can be subtle. And they don't have to be, you know, the super obvious down and out. Um, so why do we care about trying to localize this in, in the ED? So one, you just want to make sure that you actually have a CN3 policy because it does affect imaging and disposition. So does it, do the findings actually fit with a CN3 policy um, and, and your suspected diagnosis? And there's a few unusual presentations that might throw you off. Um, and then also, so if you localize it because of, um, let's say there's, you know, CN3 with CN2, if you, if if you don't, if you don't consider what fits with the CN3, you might actually just get, you know, an MR without looking at the orbits and miss uh, an actual, you know, orbital apex process or something like that. And the four kind of places where you're thinking are listed there, midbrain, you know, fascicle, subarachnoid space, and camera sinus, and then something sitting in the orbit there. Um, so here's an unusual thing that could throw you off. You know, can you get bilateral ptosis with a unilateral CN3 palsy? And 100% that's true. That actually localizes it to the brainstem. Um, and you expect bilateral ptosis here just because the uh, levator nucleus is a single thing that sits in the cranial nerve three nucleus. So it's one structure. So if it's effective, uh, if it's affected, it's going to affect both eyes. Um, so have a look at both eyes. If you, if you think there's ptosis from a CN3 palsy, um, there's a very, very rare exception, which I'm not going to bother mentioning, uh, cause it will just add to confusion. Um, and by the same principle, you can see that how the medial rectus is generally protected from lesions here, given it's got, you know, multiple different uh, areas in the nucleus that's responsible for its function. Uh, in terms of the locations of the lesions, is just another schematic identifying that. If you focus on spot one and spot two, uh, this is where you get those midbrain lesions that affect the CN3 nucleus, um, and you get that bilateral um, ptosis potentially. Um, at point two there, you know, the, the cranial nerve has left uh, the nucleus and is traveling through the brainstem. So if lesions here almost always are going to have some other neurologic symptoms. So you're going to have some kind of trem tremor or, you know, cruciform movements, or you're going to have, you know, hemiplegia or ataxia. So you're going to be thinking stroke already. These people with these symptoms mandate stroke protocol. Um, so it's not, it's not generally a mystery. In terms of you know uh, subarachnoid cavernous sinus orbital apex, as we previously dis discussed in Depopia, you generally have other findings. So if you have you know headache with acute CN3 palsy, you got to consider subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, and this should also be considered in someone who's Im immunosuppressed, some kind of subarachnoid lesion um, or infection. Um, I think it's always good to check for other cranial nerves in the pro in proximity, particularly at CN4 which can be confirmed by visualizing intact into origin with downward gaze. Um, and then with orbital fissure and orbital pathology, they also tend to occur with, you know, optic neuropathy, chemosis, like we said, uh, in, like conjunctival injection and proptosis. Um, so here's some pearls. So, uh, you know, bilateral ptosis seems bizarre. It still fits with an isolated CN3. So you can still go down that pathway. And if a patient presents, you know, with what, she, what on history sounds like a cranial nerve issue, and, but now they report spontaneous improvement. I think you still got to consider aneur aneurysmal compression and they're likely getting admit for extensive imaging um, just because aneurysmal lesions can wax and wane. So I would support an aggressive imaging approach. In acute uh, third nerve palsy and sudden headache or meningeal signs, again, subarachnoid needs to be excluded. Um, in terms of a painful CN3 palsy, you know, it's historically thought to point you towards aneurysm. That's not true at all. Uh, you know, micro ischemic causes also can be painful. Um, and there's a reason for that, which again, we're not going to get into, but painful CN3 palsy is not particularly helpful. Um, and then the last point, aberrant regeneration can lead to some really bizarre findings that still localize to a CN3, but it's basically someone post-traumatic or a progressive, slow growing compressive lesion. So if you see something weird where, um, you know, you get lid retraction or pupil constriction when, um, the, per the person looks down, you got to think about aberrant regeneration of, of cranial nerve three. Um, so don't be shocked if you see that. In terms of mimics, there's some mimics to keep in mind. So, you know, orbit op orbitopathies, as we've discussed, there's other orbital clues. Um, opto can do some, you know, active versus passive things to test, but generally you're getting imaging there. Myasthenia gravis, as we talked about, always pupil sparing. Look for other factors on history. There's, there's exam maneuvers you can do, which is Kogan lid twitch, ice pack tests, tensilon tests, all of that. And in terms of skew deviation, it can look like a pupil sparing CN3, and we'll talk about skew a little later.
Um, in terms of aneurysms, I just want to point out, you know, let's say you get a CTA looking for, you know, you, you've been a good doc, you found a CN3 lesion, you order the CTA, the radiologist says, you know, there's no, there's no PCOM classic lesion, but there's an incidental basal or artery aneurysm and nothing else to cause that presentation. So they're asking, you know, are you sure it's a CN3 palsy? Do you refer to outpatient follow-up? And the teaching point really is that aneurysm at any of those locations listed there on the left can cause a CN3 palsy. The PCOM is just a classic one. Um, so if you've considered mimics, you believe you have a CN3, bottom line, aggressive imaging, they're almost certainly getting uh, admit. And that may include, you know, CTA, MRA, which has excellent sensitivity, but angiography remains a gold standard. Uh, that's pretty much it there. Um, in terms of this lesion, so um, this would be a CN4 lesion, and it's classically the most difficult to identify, and it's, it, it can be a challenge even for ophthalmologists. Uh, double vision is most prominent looking down. So if, if someone's talking about, you know, it's worse when I'm going downstairs or reading, uh, consider that. Um, it exits from the nucleus dorsally and crosses to the contralateral side, and it's the only nerve that does this. So it's quite prone to trauma, um, get, causing unilateral, bilateral policies, uh, and its only role is inter innervating the superior oblique. So it, it primarily presents really with only diplopia. Um, given it can be tough to identify, the quick shortcut is just look for intorsion. So uh, you can look at uh, you know, the blood vessels there as a landmark and have the patient look down. And if you see intorsion, so rotation kind of towards the, the nose there, uh, you like your, your CN4 nerve is likely intact as it's the primary uh, intorter of the eye. Um, there's formally this three-step test, which is actually like five steps. Just note this exists and you can refer to it if you ever really want to uh, try to localize this. Um, but really that shortcut is a good way to get around that. Um, so why does it matter if you find a CN4? You may have noticed the diplopia algorithm doesn't include CN4. Um, essentially because it's an outpatient problem. It's a supportive care problem generally. So skew is really the only thing I want to comment on that's a mimic and the only thing you don't want to miss. In terms of ocular nerves, it's very high on, you know, Anderson's I care but I'm not concerned scale. Um, so using some of those exam tips can help you isolate policy to CN4, which then allows you to disposition the patient safely as an outpatient without any imaging. Um, skew is what, just what I was mentioning, which is a mimic that you really should look for. So if you have a vertical... Um, eye misalignment, so hypertropia, that could be CN4 or potentially skew. Um, a quick test is really, because this is a, a VOR issue, if you lay the patient down and then kind of have a look for the degree of hypertropia, if that improves by greater than 50%, you got to think skew, and that person's getting admit for MRI and further workup because it's almost always a posterior fossa uh, lesion. Whereas if it's CN4 issue, that hypertropia will not improve at all based on head position because, again, it doesn't depend on VOR. Uh, just getting into CN6, uh, so that's you know abduction deficits. Um, its location is kind of a farther away from CN3 and CN4, so um, less often you'll, you'll get uh, associated symptoms there. Um, in the setting of horizontal diplopia, you got to think INO, as we talked about before. So have a look, check for an INO, um, as again that requires admission. CN3 is generally a microvascular disease issue. Um, it frequently resolves on its own in three months. And, and generally, the teaching is if it persists beyond three months, then they probably need an MRI to rule out compressive lesions or something leading to elevated ICP. In terms of your differential, really think Graves, myasthenia, orbital apex disorder. So the same things are coming up, and the differential is, 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 is similar again. Um, again, lesions at the nucleus or fascicle, you expect other prominent neurologic findings. Uh, there's a few caveats. So uh, CN6 palsy, based on its location, uh, has tendency to be associated with intracranial pressure because it's tethered at two points as it's crossing through that space. So really consider, is, is there an elevated ICP issue? Um, and you know, if you're not confident in fundoscopy and whatnot, you can have them sent to uh, an optometrist or whatnot quickly uh, to assess for pathedema. And if that would be the case, they'd have to return to the ED. Um, and just note that both high or low ICP can result in traction on that cranial nerve. Um, so it is a false localizing feature because you don't know where the mass is that's causing the increased ICP. Um, and I think the only real pearl to note from here is that in the pediatric population, if you get a CN6 palsy, those have to get admit because that almost always is related to malignancy, whereas, that, whereas in adults, these patients generally are just discharged. Um, 
so as I said, yeah, bottom line, it's generally microvascular disease. Um, in patients, you know, over 50 where, you, where microvascular disease is expected, imaging is generally not suggested. Again, if it persists within three months, sure, imaging. If you have someone that's young, then you got to maybe consider a CTA. So if it's someone that's young or bilateral palsy, consider Wernicke's. And if it's pediatrics, admit for MI, but otherwise we don't really care. Um, now, in just in the last few minutes, just positive visual symptoms I want to talk about. When do you care? When do you just discharge the patient with follow-up? Um, so again, the major branch point, unilateral versus bilateral. Um, so thus, anyone commenting on kind of flashes, floater, always think, you know, entopic phenomenon, so retinal or vitreous issue. Otherwise, your differential really is migraine versus occipital seizure. Um, so migraine, you tend to get these zigzag squiggles called the fortification scotomas, which grow and build up and kind of march across the visual field. Um, and last at least generally 20 minutes. Whereas the occipital seizures are generally almost always just seconds. The uh, visual phenomena are, are bilateral and there are usually colored circles and you can get autonomic symptoms, vomiting, pallor, sweating, uh, especially in the pediatric population. In terms of migraine specifically, given it's so common, you'll, you'll generally see uncommon features of migraine come up way more often than rare other disorders of secondary migraine. So you're almost always gonna be right um, if you're considering positive phenomenon as migraineous. Um, and unfortunately, only a minority of patients with migraine fit entirely into this international classification of migraine, and it remains a clinical diagnosis. So when is it not migraine? Um, these features should raise doubts. So if you have brief visual aura lasting just seconds or less than five minutes, you gotta think uh, a civil seizure. Um, greater than an hour of, of visual aura with migraine is unusual. Older patients that don't have a prior history of migraine, again, they need the full workup. Uh, visual aura without headache is really in the minority of patients, only about 5% of migraine patients. Um, and if visual phenomena are always occurring in the same location, that really shouldn't happen with migraine. And then on that chart there, you just see kind of common features of both to help you work your way through. In terms of some weird higher order visual symptoms, just to clue you in, um, that may be a, a cortical, a structural or demyelinating lesion. Uh, you don't want to disregard these as non-organic disease, giving kind of unusual descriptions. So practically, if anyone, if any patient is describing anything like these particular phenomenon, you really got to consider a structural lesion uh, for imaging. So whether you want to do a CT and then refer to ophthalmology, that's not unreasonable. And uh, on the left there, you see kind of the tracking of images, which is um, an important clue. Some people might have kind of facial recognition or facial blindness, uh, where they can't recognize other people's faces or their own face. And then other people may have, you know, color vision loss there. So object agnosia, um, or sorry, acromatopsia. Um, and if that's developed acutely, that again, warrants imaging. Charles Bonnet syndrome is a particular thing that is noted as well. It happens in people that are generally nearly always blind. It's a positive kind of phantom image that repeats. It can be anything. Um, and generally don't have any other features of psychosis. So they don't really need uh, a psychiatric follow-up. It's not a psychosis. Um, it's benign. Um, they don't generally need any follow-up and it's incompletely in, uh, understood. Um, so generally you can just reassure the patients. And lastly, just quickly, quickly touching on functional vision loss. Um, it makes up, you know, a significant uh, percentage of who we send to ophthalmology, significant costs. Just funny enough, there is a sunglass sign which has a, like 99% specificity for functional vision loss in a large study done in um, clinic patients. So that is a big clue. Um, in terms of some tips, if it's a monocular visual field deficit, deficit uh, still, you can basically check if the deficit still persists if both eyes are open. If it does, and they're reporting that monocular visual field deficit, you know, non-organic disease. If you have bilateral uh, decreased visual acuity, you can just do Snell and chart testing. And just one thing that's like enthusiastically reported in the literature is having like focusing on the very small letters and just being so frustratingly slow moving through there that the patient wants you to move on and starts reading the the uh, the Snellen chart and then if there's visual field loss you can basically have them saccade to your finger which is positioned in their blind spot and if they can stop on your finger and track there in the blind spot it means they don't have a blind spot there um, if there's a severe deficit the, the other clue is if, if visual acuity is so severely effective you should expect an RAPD if it's uh, organic um, and then just know again we're not going to be excluding this but ophthalmology has got some other tips and tricks that they use. So mirror tests, these drums and colored lenses to really exclude it, but it can help you, uh, you know, avoid imaging or admission in these patients with a discussion with ophthalmology for outpatient clinic follow-up. Um, pretty much out of time. So I'll just skip the case resolution. 
Um, but basically, it was a, a mechanical orbitopathy, idiopathic, um, and treated with steroids. So uh, thanks for your attention. I'll take any questions. Um, I'm happy to send this out again. I know it's a lot, um, and then we can have people go over it again or just have it as a reference if you want. Thanks again for your time. Assuming there's not a lot of questions here so far. I think you've got a group of uh, brilliant listeners. <laughs> Sorry, I know that was super fast uh, and I apologize for that. I just want to... Very, very detailed, Mike, and very comprehensive. Um, may need to uh, go back and review it, uh, do it again uh, in slow time. <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll send that out just so, so people can have that. If you have any questions, let me know. I'm happy to chat about things. Um, but I did want to just give you some, you know, pearls and pitfalls. And again, thanks so much for your time. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike.